For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. When he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. We'll stop right there. In other words, what we're seeing here is, again, uh, Jesus did not come and say that the in the Sermon on the Mount that the old law is going to be binding until the end of the world. Uh, what he's saying is, uh, again, and we're going to notice this as we're going through, and he came to fulfill the law. He came to fulfill uh, the, the Old Testament. We're going to see that. Again, Christ's purpose was not to destroy the law and the prophets. In order to destroy the law and the prophets, that would require three specific things that Jesus would have to do. First of all, he would have had to have been found disobeying the law. He would have been, had to have been disobeying what that law said. And then also, he would have had to have destroyed the prophecies. In other words, not fulfill them. Prophecies concerning his death, burial, resurrection, all of those would have to not come to pass. Also, it would destroy the law's purpose. One of the, law, the law's purpose was to show that people were in sin and that we need a Savior. And we're going to look at a scripture that shows us that here in just a moment. But as we look at this again, destroying the law would require these three specific things to occur. The simple fact of the matter is Christ never did any of these things. Matter of fact, you read through the scripture, he did the exact opposite. You see, his uh, purpose was to fulfill the command. Look back over there in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. There in Matthew chapter 5, again looking in verse <clears throat> looking in verse uh, 17, he says, I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. Verse 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke. Letter or stroke, letter could be, uh, I think the King James Version says jot. That the idea of a jot is just a small letter. Uh, I think it also uses the word tittle stroke, uh, is what the New American Standard says. Uh, that's the idea of, well, maybe a dot of an eye, uh, just a single stroke of the pen. It's not going to disappear. The smallest part of the law is not going to disappear what it, when, until when, he says. It says, the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law uh, until all is accomplished. Or, again, the King James Version said, fulfilled. And we see that he fulfilled, uh, he, he was obeying the law, and he was fulfilling the law. He came to fulfill what was written. For example, he obeyed the Old Covenant. He obeyed the Old Testament law. One example, I think the greatest example, is how he fulfilled the command to love your neighbor as yourself. Remember that in Leviticus 19, verse 18? Talks about not bearing a grudge against your neighbor, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, the second greatest command of the law. You know, he showed that love in many ways, whether it was looking to folks who were hungry and when he fed the 5,000, and sometime later he would feed 4,000. And there was other times he showed his love, but I think the greatest example is when he showed that love on the cross. In 1 Peter chapter 3, turn over there if you will, look at verse 18. First Peter 3 verse 18 tells us, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. There's a lot of love in that, being able to bring us to God. Remember, we were separated from God. That's what the Bible says. We were dead in our sins. But he made it possible for us to come to God. It says he made us alive with him. Ephesians chapter 2. And so we see just an example of how Jesus loved his neighbor as himself when he gave himself up to die for everyone. His neighbor. Another thing he did. He fulfilled the prophecies. He didn't break any of them. He fulfilled them. Over and over again, he was uh, fulfilling prophecies. In Genesis 3, verse 15, we read about the really the first prophecy concerning Christ. It talks about uh, Jesus being born of the seed of woman. Let's go ahead and turn over there to Genesis chapter 3. 
want to make sure I quote this right for you. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. <clears throat> Genesis 3, verse 15 says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. That's talking about Christ. And you shall bruise him on the heel. And so we're seeing that right there, bruising him on the head. I probably should have put bruising Satan, if you will. Crushing Satan in this uh, regard uh, when he well, when he paid that ultimate death on the cross. We also see in Isaiah 53, we're not going to read through that, but we read about the suffering of Christ over and over again, just about how, how much he suffered as a servant of God and suffered for our transgressions, it talks about. Think about his birth in Bethlehem. These are just random ones. There's a whole bunch of prophecies that he fulfilled. I'm just throwing uh, some different ones up here. The fact that he was born in Bethlehem, that's in Micah chapter 5. Uh, the fact that he would be betrayed, that's in Psalm 41 verse 9. There was uh, all kinds of scriptures that he was fulfilling. He was uh, not breaking prophecy, he was fulfilling it. But he also fulfilled the purpose of the old law. You look at Galatians chapter 3. I want you to notice with me verse 24. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Galatians chapter 3, <clears throat> in verse 24, it says, the law, Therefore the law has become our tutor, I think some translations might say schoolmaster, to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. The law's purpose was to point to Christ, to lead folks to Christ. And you know, Christ would have then therefore been the fulfillment of that. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4 says, Those things which were written aforetime were written for our learning, so that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. We have hope in Christ. Christ is our hope. And a lot of folks still say like to say that this is something that's uh, the old law is still something that needs to be obeyed. But, but, but think of it in, in this regard. When that word fulfill, again, it means to fill full. It means to uh, complete. Think of this in terms of maybe a contract. If a person were to, uh, for example, uh, get, uh, if a boss signed a contract with an employee uh, saying he was going to pay him $100,000 a year plus some raises and that contract would last 10 years. Well, Ten years comes, the payments are all made, the co contract is fulfilled, it's completed. Well, okay, now it's completed. Can you go back and do more stuff with that contract after it's completed? Oh, no. It's done. It's completed. It's fulfilled. There's nothing else you can do with it. That's the same thing. Uh, you know, you can go back and read it. You can study it. You can use it for maybe, you know, for maybe... Uh, some application for maybe another contract, but it's been fulfilled. You can't do. You, you can't go back and uh, and fulfill responsibilities to it because it's already been done. It's the same way with the old covenant. We can go back to it. We can learn lessons from it. We can learn about God's attitude towards sin, but we can't go back and fulfill its commands because it's all been fulfilled. And so you see it, it's kind of similar in that regard. The question comes about, though, well, Jesus said he came to fulfill. He said he came to bring that old covenant to completion. Well, when did that happen? In mind of a couple different passages in the New Testament. Turn over to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Jesus was hanging on the cross in this section. He's about ready to die. And in John chapter 19 and verse 30, this is what it says. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said what? It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That's when he died. What was finished? What was fulfilled? What was completed? Well, part of among different things, his purpose. His purpose to fulfill the old covenant. 
Another good passage, Luke 24, verse 24. It's, in that, it's at that cross that Jesus brought the Old Covenant to its fulfillment. Luke 24, verse 44 states, Now he said to them, he's talking to his uh, disciples. Now he said to them, These are my words, <clears throat> which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. It, the scripture was fulfilled. It was brought to completion. So that's what Christ did when he died on the cross. He brought that old covenant to completion. That's what we're reading about here. Now there's something else he brings up though in this section. He says, do not annul the commandments and don't teach others to do the same. If you pay attention, look back over there in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, he's going to tell them this. Verse 19, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You see, he's referencing the fact that the old covenant was still in effect when they were standing there. And so they needed to be still obeying it, still going back and obeying what God had said in the law of Moses and the prophets and those things that had yet to be fulfilled. Again, if this is talking about today, I mean, if Jesus said he brought the old covenant to completion, then that, that just doesn't match up. As we use that analogy of the contract. When a contract is brought to completion, it no longer needs to be fulfilled. You don't need to be going back and saying, how much money do I need to give this person? You don't, the person who you gave money to doesn't need to say, okay, what tasks do I need to fulfill for the boss? Because he's already, that contract's already been completed. And so, <clears throat> again, it had, now at this point, that old covenant was not brought back to completion. It was not brought uh, to be fulfilled. It still needed to be fulfilled. It still needed to be obeyed by those living in that time. But what we're seeing here is he's saying, look, you need to be still obeying what's written. There's still these tasks that you need to fulfill. You need to be not annulling one of these commandments. And he says the reason for that is that those who did would be called least in the kingdom. And he, he's talking about the scribes and Pharisees. We can see that in verse 20. For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. One of the things, this was one of the things that the scribes and Pharisees did. And he's going to start correcting some things, uh, some twisted scriptures, you might say. Some ways that the Pharisees and scribes had twisted the scripture in the next section, and we're going to see that, Lord willing, next Sunday. You're going to see this phrase, you have heard that it was said. Jesus is going to repeat that over and over and over again. You have heard that it was said. One example, the last passage, uh, the last part of uh, chapter 5 of Matthew, the last one he addresses, he'd say, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, that first part's in the Old Covenant. That first part is written in the Old Covenant. But what about that second statement, hate your enemy? When did God ever say in the Old Covenant, hate your enemy? Where do we ever read in anywhere between Genesis to Malachi, hate your enemies? The simple answer to that question is it's not there. They had twisted scripture to make it say something it didn't. They were twisting the scripture. The Pharisees did that. This happens today. People twist scriptures to uh, come up with a whole bunch of uh, different things. They twist the scriptures to say we need to add a common meal to the Lord's Supper. People twist scriptures for other reasons besides that. But this was something that the Pharisees and the scribes were heavily guilty of. He's going to address six different examples of this. He's going to say, you've heard this. You've heard that it was said, 
And the next thing he's going to bring up is, do not commit murder. What the Pharisees were teaching was that don't commit murder, but you know what? You can treat your brother like dirt. Don't murder your brother. Just, just, just look. You can treat him like dirt. Just don't murder him. That's one of the things the Pharisees and scribes were telling people. And we're going to see that again more as we get into Matthew chapter 5. We're going to address that more next Sunday. But he basically says, look, that's not what the old covenant is saying at all. That's not what God said. And then he starts addressing, here's what you need to do if you are angry with your brother. We're, again, we're going to look more at that, Lord willing. On uh, Actually, not next Sunday. I'm going to be gone this Sunday. But uh, Lord willing, after the Sunday after Andrew Robertson is here, we'll be looking into that. But as we're going through this, again, this is one of the reasons why he says he'll be, they'll be called least in the kingdom. You know, here today... No, I never meet anyone who says, I hope someday, I like to, someday I'd like to be like a Pharisee. Someday I'd like to be as wise as a Pharisee. We, we never hear that. Why? Because the Pharisees are always looked down upon. To this day, Pharisees are looked down upon because of how they approach the Scriptures, how they approach Christ, how they approach God, their attitude and... Well, their attitude towards their fellow Jews. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why we say these shall be called least is because again, they were annulling the commandments. They were doing all kinds of things contrary to the law of Moses. Again, we'll see some of that even more as we go through uh, this study in the Sermon on the Mount. Just some applications I want to make before we conclude uh, this afternoon. First of all, we see that we are no longer bound to keep the Old Testament since Christ had fulfilled. He completed it. There's nothing to go back and obey. It's already been completed. The, its purpose has been completed. All those things that people say in the world, people in the world say that we need to be following Sabbath. People say we need to be uh, following. Uh, there's a few people that say we need to burn incense still. There's people that say we need to uh, go back to use mechanical instruments because that's what's written in the Old Testament. I mean, there's just so many things that are brought up and stated, like as if they're still binding today. And the simple fact of the matter is it's just not. Again, it's been completed. It's been fulfilled. There's nothing to go back and obey. What we do see, though, is things we can learn about God, His attitude towards sin, and examples. But also another application is just as Christ commanded the Jews to obey the Old Testament back when it was still in effect, he now commands us to obey the New Testament. As we, we've looked over this, but again, the words of the apostles, you can read this in John 16. The words of the apostles came from the Holy Spirit, which came from Christ. You see, the Holy Spirit was revealing Christ's will to the apostles after Jesus had already ascended. And he, again, you can read more about that in John chapter 16. But this is, again, he commands us to obey what's written in the New Testament. And we need to do just that. Maybe we failed in that. Maybe there's certain parts of the New Covenant we failed in. Again, the Beatitudes, those are things but that were, uh, of course, uh, things that would be in the that they would need to be heeding under the Old Covenant. But you have, if you take other New Testament scriptures, you can see that that was, that would be applied to the New Covenant as well. We've talked about those Beatitudes a little bit today and, and uh, a little bit last week. Maybe we failed there. Maybe we failed somewhere else. Maybe we failed to grow as Christians should, and because of that we fall away. If that's the case, you can return to God today by repenting of your sin, confessing, your sin, and we'll pray to God for forgiveness on your behalf if you come forward and do that this afternoon. Perhaps uh, know that maybe you've never become a Christian, though. Maybe you've never decided to follow Jesus. Maybe you've never decided to put Christ on. How do you do that? You put Him on through baptism, but in order to be saved, you have to believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be baptized. When you're baptized, 
then you're saved. Again, you read this throughout the scriptures. 1 Peter 3, verse 21, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Mark 16, verse 16, he who believes and is <clears throat> baptized shall be saved. Acts 22, verse 16, now why do you delay? Uh, arise and be baptized, wash your way your sins, calling on his name. And if you need to do that this evening, we can help you with that. If you need to be saved, if you need to get your heart right with God, please don't hesitate. Get it right with Him right now as we stand and sing. Oh, so, and...